I'm going to shift gears a bit and talk about science communication and using industry as a platform for science communication. Again, my name is Nicole Quinn. Uh, I want to start with a question. So where, as scientists, do you get your scientific information? How do you keep on top of the, the research that's happening in your field? So um, I'm going to guess that your answer is the scientific literature. So that, of course, is the foundation of how scientists communicate with one another. Um, and it's kind of you know, allowed us to, uh, to get this far in terms of science. There are, however, many caveats to scientific journal articles. The first is the sheer volume of them. Um, in the stem cell field alone, there are approximately 80 new publications per day, seven days a week, uploaded to PubMed. So I know some pretty incredible scientists, but uh, I don't know anyone who reads 80 publications seven days a week. So that's one um, issue with, with publications. The second is that they're cryptic, they're hard to understand, and they are um, selective. They tend to only publish the positive side of the scientific story. Uh, and the third is the time lag. Um, it takes approximately two years for a study to be written up, submitted, peer reviewed, and published which means that if you are a researcher who is relying on uh, academic journal articles alone to keep current on your field, you are two years behind the cutting edge of your field. So I don't know how we can expect science to progress when our researchers are two years behind on what's happening in labs. So currently there's some, or obviously there's some room to improve there. Uh, well, how do we access unpublished data? We go to posters. So I'm happy to see that the posters here are not printed, but they st and, and they're sort of they're electronic, but they're still uh, face some of the challenges, which is that you have to basically fly to another city and stand in front of your poster and hope that somebody else has flown to that city and comes visit to you at that poster where you can talk to them about your unpub unpublished research. So obviously a very analog way of doing things and very resource intensive. If you're lucky, you can skip a poster and you get to do a 12 minute talk where you summarize an entire body of research within you know, a few slides. So, Clearly, these, this system of how we communicate research among scientists is old and antiquated and, and analog and, and not particularly um, futurized, if that's a word. <laughs> so what can we do about this? I think it's time to change and to augment this system with some new platforms and tools. However, I know that scientists are busy. I don't think that we can rely on academic scientists uh, to do this. I don't think they have the time or the resources to really shift this paradigm. My job at Stem Cell, I'm the Senior Manager of Scientific Communications, and I run a program with, along with 10 other people uh, that comes up with services or manages services and tools that facilitate access to scientific information. And we do that, of course, from a very unlikely place, industry. So I would like to tell you about two examples of our program and, and how we're, we're doing this. Uh, the first is Connexin Creative. So backing up, when I was about halfway through my PhD research, I finally admitted to myself that I hated lab work. I loved science, but I did not enjoy being at the bench. And I decided to, when I graduated my PhD, to leave research. And I took a job as a scientific communications and publishing team lead at Stem Cell Technologies. My job there was to oversee the management of 11 weekly newsletters. These were e-digests that essentially covered all of the, the latest publications, press releases, jobs and events in various 11 various fields of cell biology. The newsletters had been started by Dr. Alan Eves, the founder of, of Stem Cell. Uh, they'd been running for about 10 years at the time, and they were sent to over 30,000 researchers. Uh, this was sort of a passion project of his because he had been in academia for a 40-year career and knew about the tedium and the you know, sheer volume of papers and how impossible it was for scientists to keep current on their field. And he was trying to come up with ideas of ways that he could enable scientists to spend more time at the bench. However, also coming from academia, he knew that it was very unlikely that a, an academic scientist would trust an email that was coming from uh, industry, from a technology company. He thought, um, and I, I think he was right, that scientists would assume that the newsletters contained biased content, that we were hand selecting papers that were using stem cell products or that were, or we excluded papers that used competitor products. 
And by the way, this was completely untrue. Um, we choose papers that go into the, to the newsletters based on three criteria. One, is it current? Was it published online within the last two weeks? Two, is it on scope with the newsletter topic? And three, is it published in a journal whose impact factor is greater than two? And that are st that's still the criteria. So, However, uh, to avoid this bias and to ensure that scientists would actually use this service that Alan had created, he branded the newsletters under the name Connects and Creative. And it was not publicly known that Connects and Creative was part of stem cell technologies. That part was, was kept kind of hidden. <laughs> so he actually went out of his way to hide the fact that he was creating this free service. Um, incidentally, when I took this job, I was not very excited about it. Um, when I thought that I was going to be moving from uh, an academic research uh, sort of world into science communications, I thought I was gonna be working on something far more sexy than email newsletters, and I thought I was gonna be able to do it from somewhere that had more creative freedom than industry. And I gave myself about two years. I thought, if I do this for two years and earn the salary, then I can move on. Um, so a few weeks after starting, or as I started sort of digging into this new job of mine, I started looking at the feedback that these newsletters were getting. And we were hearing things like, what would I do without extracellular matrix news? Or my lab uh, goes through mesenchymal cell news every week in lab meeting, and it's how we keep current on what's going on. Or my favorite, this publication is more useful than annoying, which I think is the ultimate compliment you can get from a scientist. So I was sort of brought back to my days in grad school and how I constantly felt behind on the literature and on everything. And, uh, and I thought, oh my goodness, if somebody had sent me a free email every week summarizing the top 10 publications I should read in my field, like I would pay for it, like that, that's golden. And I started to kind of see the potential that this system had and, and this service had and, and uh, started to you know, get a little bit inspired by it. And so fast forward seven years, we now have 21 different newsletters. These are sent to over 50,000 researchers around the world every single week. Um, each newsletter also has its own Twitter feed. So if you see your field up there, you can go to sciencestemcellnewsletters.com and you can subscribe, or you can go on Twitter and find the associated Twitter feed. Um, we collectively have over 50,000 Twitter followers as well. Um, and yeah, they're, they're doing incredibly well. Um, so that's my first example of what we're doing uh, in, in science communication and stem cell. The second example I wanted to share with you is the stem cell podcast. So as opposed to uh, the connects and newsletters which were started within stem cell, the podcast was started um, externally. It was two um, scientists who were postdocs at the time in 2013. They decided to start up a podcast for stem cell biologists. And they sort of did this off the side of their desk for a couple of years and really started to realize that they were spending more time kind of just trying to keep the lights on and chasing down sponsorships than they were really focusing on the science. And so in 2016, they approached Stem Cell. We had kind of built a relationship with them. We had been sponsoring them over the years. And they asked us if we'd like to acquire the podcast. And I had long been looking at podcasting as sort of the next step for our SciComm program at Stem Cell. I had, we'd done social media, we'd done these newsletters, we have a bunch of web websites, and I was like, we need to get into podcasting. So we jumped at the opportunity. We took over the podcast in 2016. We kept the format the same. Um, and the host of that podcast is Dr. Dalen James. He's a stem cell biologist, associate professor in stem cell biology at uh, Weill Cornell University. We are also looking for a co-host. So if any of you are uh, science communicators in stem cell biology and want to apply, just listen to the podcast. You can find it on iTunes and Spotify and it'll tell you how to apply. Um, so what Dalen does, every other week we have an ep a new episode and he'll summarize, he'll pick about five papers in, uh, in the stem cell field and he'll summarize the papers and provide his commentary and insights on the papers. And then he'll sit down and have a conversation with somebody who's working in the stem cell field. And I specifically use the word conversation to describe this as opposed to the word interviews because we're really looking to dig deep into science we don't just want to talk to these researchers about their publications. We know that people can go to the literature and find out that information. 
what we want to do is, is really um, provide a portal into the minds of these scientists so that we can provide mentorship and really you know, facilitate blue sky ideas and talk about new hypotheses and where the field is going and, and what the next steps are for research. And we also, on the flip side, want to talk about some of the things that you never hear about outside of sort of the closed doors of a lab, like the big dead ends, the failed experiments, the enormous lab blunders, uh, the, the negative results, um, the things that, in my experience as an academic researcher, uh, taught me the most about the field and about my research. So that's kind of what we want to do with the podcast. Um, so wrapping up, I have this phone here to tell me how to wrap up this talk. <laughs> uh, I said that I was going to stay at stem cell for two years, and obviously it's been seven and I'm no plans on leaving. So why is that? Um, I don't think I could have had the opportunity to do as much for science communication anywhere else. I know that had I tried to do it on my own as sort of a startup, I would have ended up in the same place as those podcast scientists who ended up having to give up because they couldn't find enough funding. I know if I tried to do it in an academic setting, kind of off the side of my desk, or tried to sort of garner volunteers to help, it would have been a constant struggle to get the support I need. Conversely, at Stem Cell, I have had access to a full team of graphic designers, a full team of web developers, a videographer, a sound engineer, a whole research and development department, um, all of whom are willing, uh, plus Dr. Alan Eves, who is just 100% behind supporting scientists in any way he can. So all of this has enabled me to push and promote and to grow this pro program in a way I don't think we could have done anywhere else. So what's the significance of the phone? <laughs> so communication has changed. We no longer use this weird device to contact people, share our news. Uh, we don't use print publication as much anymore. We don't use snail mail. We've discovered the internet. So we need to change the way we communicate science, particularly among scientists. It's time, we, we, we were implored yesterday in the opening remarks for this conference to move faster, to accelerate fields faster than we ever have before. And I think to do that, we really need to augment how we share information with each other. And I think we need to look to alternative places and alternative sources for our information. And I hope I've shown you tonight, today, this afternoon, that uh, industry can really facilitate that, that exchange of information and can be a trusted partner in your science communication. So thank you very much.